Hey, kia ora koutou whanau. Welcome back to another edition of Big Hearing News. Kia ora Chewy. You got your beanie on. You got your bad boy beanie on. I'm always, I'm always bad. You naughty boy beanie. Is that what it's called? Yep. Naughty boy beanie? Yeah, Something why like not? Why not? Hey team, hope you're all well. Hope everyone's having a good old time. How you been, Chewy? How's the weekend? Uh, pretty quiet. Uh, obviously, I had that week surgical procedure end of the week, so mm-hmm. so just uh, playing it, playing it low. Yeah, pretty pretty chill. Um, actually, kind of nice just to have a, have a break. Um, for more than just a couple of days. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially in the run up to Christmas and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah it's gonna be. Too bad. I know it's terrifying. What are we today? The twentieth. So in other words, one month and five days till Christmas. It's I prefer to say that out loud. I prefer keeping track via my imminent departure for my two weeks away in the US. More so than how Christmas. Far is that? How far is that? Uh, when is it? Ninth of January. I, I'm I'm leaving for America. I've, are you going to be? Uh, whereabouts are you going to be? We're in America. Um, I am going to be very briefly in San Francisco and then yep. very briefly in Denver. And then I cool, am right. going up into the mountains above Denver yep. uh, for a weekend. Right. Uh, and then back to Denver for, for a couple of nights. And then I think it's three or four nights in San Francisco before coming back. Because I was um, thinking as the, as the stand-up comedian that you are, do you have that thought of trying to get to Austin? Seems to be the comedy uh, center of the world at the moment. Go to the mothership or something? Oh, I, you'd have to go through the rest of Texas to get there. True. Um, like, they're, they're, America's always been a weird one. Like, we, whenever I've traveled, it's it's been, you know, I don't know whether I'll ever be able to do this again, so I'm going to spread myself as thin as possible and see as many yep. sites. So this is kind of an unusual trip for me because it's just two and a half weeks. Uh, and I'm just having to restrain my urge to go and see as much as I can. And just, right. we go into two cities and what do we want to do in those two cities? Um, you mentioned comedy. I want to see like Denver's got a great comedy scene. So is San Francisco. Yep. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just nice to do a deep dive. Like I've never thought, no, who, who goes, ah, oh, I'd love to go to Denver someday. I know nothing about Denver. Um, so Colorado is some good writing so. out. Lots of people say yeah. good things about Colorado. Well, well, this is the thing. I think people have been sleeping on Denver. It looks amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as far as America, though, you know, like I'd love to go and see a punk rock festival called the Fest that happens in Florida every year. Um, I'd love to just be absolutely overloaded by everything that New York has to offer. Um, sometime, hopefully, someday. Um, do you think, thinking about Governor Santos, that, you mm. know, you made a joke about having to go through Texas, but is it the mm. same for Florida? Like, do you feel as a traveler that Florida, f- from where you're looking at why Texas is bad, that Florida would be the same? Or does it feel different because of like the kind of beach lifestyle and the coastal access? Florida seems pretty fucking crazy. Um, I've, I've got a workmate who's, who's doing, uh, I think, almost three months. Yeah. Um, starting down in Orlando and then traveling right up into Canada. Um, and yeah, it, 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 you you can't you can't look at Florida and ignore the Florida man stories or the terrible political stories yep. or the fact that everything that's gone wrong in American politics in recent memory seems to have started in Florida. Um, it it is insane. I I had uh, a friend and an old flatmate of mine. Um, he worked for Weta and did quite a bit of work setting up a data center in Texas for okay. Weta, for Weta Digital. Yep. Um, and he he just said Texas is crazy because all all the stereotypes you have about Texas are in some way, shape, or form true. <laughs> and then you go to Austin, and Austin is its own little liberal lefty enclave. Yeah. Like they have a they have a slogan that. Uh, that the, we must keep Austin weird. Um, and he 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 was there uh, during the run up to Trump's election. Yeah, and he he was just saying it was just so weird. So he went to a Trump rally, wow. from memory, just to to see what it was. And it was like, oh, what was funny in New Zealand is not funny when you're sitting in a stadium full of it. 
Well, gosh, you're going to be if you're going to be there for half of January. That's that's going to be prime time. They're probably actually we'll have to if we're still doing this or if we're doing this or whatever, we'll have to do some crosses to you to see if you're looking at some of the primaries or something while you're over there, just out of interest. Oh God, do a bit of work. Um, no, I think famously Colorado only has a really solid, sensible elected fit. Oh no, that's where Lauren Bobert's from, isn't it? <laughs> Is it Colorado? Oh. I don't know now that I've, I've verbalized it. Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised. But thanks, um, yeah. thanks for the super chat, Nick. I uh, appreciate that. Two bucks. His late fee, he says he's doing it off his own bat. We always say this because strangers to the place will be like um, going, oh, what? You got to pay? So, uh, no, never asked. But That's enforceable by can. law. It's enforceable by law. Um, right. A couple of, couple of housekeeping. I only said shopkeeping things. Housekeeping things. Um, thank you to all the people who responded to our. Uh, conversation last week about 2024 and and big hairy news um as you can see there is an email going along the bottom of the screen right now if you're listening to the audio podcast it's big hairy news at gmail.com not that difficult to remember um and with just for people who don't know just in 60 seconds don't panic i won't blast your ears with it for hours on end uh looking to 2024 looking to funding uh saying to you guys who are our absolute grassroots um supporter since day one um, that we're basically saying to you, who do you know? Long story short, who do you know that can get on board and help financially make this happen next year? And we're looking for businesses and we're looking for, you know, I've had a few emails from people saying, I work with trusts, you know, that fund things. I work with groups and organizations. Maybe that's a part of it. But also the big question of the hard one is, who do you know that knows someone that knows someone that's one of these massive uh, capital people um, that can in, invest some capital into this like you would an internet startup company. I was thinking about that today, actually, Chewy. We are, well, I mean, we are on the internet and stuff, but it is, the difference between us and another startup is we have definitely proved the model. Um, I wrote up a document today and I looked through our numbers for October, so that's both pre and post election, and we had 700,000 views across all our video platforms. Across all of that, includes TikTok, across all of them, in October we had 700,000 views. So it's not like we're starting up a platform and having to start from ground zero. We're starting up already running at pretty good speed and we're just looking for people to be involved. So for you people who have emailed us, you've all had emails back over the weekend. And for you people who specifically came to us and said, can we see a business plan? It's not really a business plan, but more about the sponsorship advertising. I've done that document as well and pass it on to a whole bunch of people. So yeah, just reminding you and thanking you if you're involved. And if you haven't heard the build up to that, you can go back and have a look. It's pinned to the top of my Twitter feed at the moment. A little chat me and sure we had last week with you guys. And if you want to know more about it, if you're a person with connections, if you're a person with connections in the business world, if you know someone who knows someone, uh, send me an email, big here and use at gmail.com and we'll send you um, both the grassroots funding letter and also the document about if you're going to be an advertiser. That's about that for it, now. It, it, it'd be great just, just in case you needed some more uh, push um if, if we can turn this into a paid gig for me then i would be able to go back to my seventh form physics teacher mr veal um, and tell him that he was wrong that there was a, a bright future in a career in being a lippy prick yeah so yeah that'd be cool. i like i like it how you said a, a bright uh, if there's funding for you you didn't include me in that or it's just mostly for well I'm, you know you'll get funded before i i do but uh. You don't, uh, well, I don't know. Do you know Mr. Veal? Did he call you a lippy prick? Yeah, that's, bastard. That's the main takeaway there. What a prick he was, eh? He had to um, go way out of his way to find you. <laughs> let's have a look actually at one thing that happened over the weekend. We're, let's get into the show now because this is, you know, the whole uh, coalition debacle going on at the moment. The, I, I put out a tweet in the weekend and I'm interested in people's take, but I also am interested in showing you the response to it. So this is a, a tweet I put out over the weekend. Um, so this was from Stuff. Stuff.co.nz reported, quote, that there are, quote, three difficult and complex, end quote, issues left for the incoming government governing parties to get through. So we'd been told by Stuff that they had to get through three difficult and complex issues. So I said, so treaty referendum, foreign buyers tax, and what else? Um, and these are some of the things that came up. And have a think about that, Joey. I won't go through all of them because there's like a hundred of them, I think, or 76 of them. Uh, Maori seats. Uh, some of the things, uh, Maria thinks just the prime minister, who's going to be the prime minister. Um, where, the, where the woman should be allowed to work outside the home. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, deputy prime minister, maybe. That's an interesting one to get through. A provincial growth fund. Retirement age, maybe. 
maybe, 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 you and Agenda 2030 WEF and a fund for vaccine injured. Um, several people said this. They were like, you know, because of who got Winston in, that maybe he'd be asking for something like that. Um, maybe that's a sticking point. Single fuck about those people anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Their so either. Uh, so uh, Matt says three complex issues: Luxon, Peters, and Seymour. <laughs> the complex, not simple. Oh yeah, uh, judges, uh, SFO. Yeah, maybe. Um, Peter wants us out of all the WEF stuff. Well, that's again to do with the thing. Retirement age, interesting one with that. Retirement age, COVID. That kind of goes back to the um, to the thing. Deputy Prime Minister. So there's quite a few Attorney General. So there's quite a few good um, good guesses there as well as a whole bunch of piss taking. Co Deputy PMs. Co Deputy PMs. A GST to twenty percent. No foreign buyers and water privatized. What about you, uh, Chewy? Mm. Any thoughts? Because I mean, even I mean, first of all, tell me if you think I'm wrong. Are those first two tree referendum foreign buyers tax? I thought they're pretty obvious, but what's the third? What do you reckon? I would say three waters or something adjacent to that. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's been indications that they're going to roll out three waters just without Maori. Or, yeah, or they've kind of said that. Shuffle the deck a little bit. Yeah. Um, whether that's enough deck shuffling. Or, you know, that, that's what jumps to mind for me. Either that or it's going to be something insane like cycle lanes. Like, mm. I, I can imagine these three debating cycle lanes like it matters. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyone in the chat got any ideas about it? Va vaccine reparations, says Kiwi. Um, uh, there's, there's a bunch of people. Retirement in there age. Well. Retirement age again. Yeah, retirement age is an interesting one, actually. I don't know who would be pushing for that. Pro probably ACT, actually. Um, but I just thought it's an interesting interesting question. And I, I thought again this afternoon when I set up the program, uh, because I did kind of think about, um, you know, what should we do tonight? Uh, and I thought, oh, gosh, I'm doing this a bit early. What if we have a government by 6 p.m.? And I went, nah, it's not going to happen. So I was quite comfortable setting this up at 3 o'clock or whatever I did this afternoon. Uh, Dave says asset sales, privatized water. You know, yeah, I mean, that's the one that I'm really worried about. Like, like if I was to be honest, like we've seen in the past with National, you remember John Key selling off state um, asset, assets before a referendum? 49%, like in New Zealand. Yeah. 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 Just, just absolute insane shit. And like we've spoken a lot about Three Waters and the upcoming challenges that a, lo a lot of local bodies have. Yep. And with our climate future coming up and that sort of thing, how important water is, is, I would be terrified of them going, well, we don't have enough public money to fix it. So we've opened the doors to the good people at Coca-Cola Amatel uh, to, to, to fix our water. Um, I think, and I th I think that's, that's, that's the that's, that's, threat. That's an example of one of the things we talk about when they don't get through their, and we were saying, we've been saying this for six months four months, three months before the election, if they don't get through their um, foreign bias tax and they want to not be seen as hypocritical, they have to find that money from elsewhere and either cuts or selling off state assets are the two places that you look to. And it's very interesting about this because I would, I would hypothesize, I would suggest, I would meander that, I think you'll agree with me, Chewie, Think about it from a personal point of view. When you own your own house, right? You own the asset. In an ideal world, if you want to build wealth, you don't sell that house. You borrow against it and you buy another one. In an ideal world, if one wanted to build wealth through through housing, you'd never sell a house. In other words, holding on to the assets and borrowing against them seems to be more sensible. These people who are on the right and who tend to want to privatize things, they seem to want to do the opposite when it comes to public assets. But I guarantee with their private assets, they'll be trying to keep and buy again, keep and buy again, keep and buy again, you know, borrow again, keep, borrow again, buy again, keep, borrow again, buy again. But when it comes to government money, they're like, sell, get rid of. And it makes no sense to me. I mean, I think it's actually un um, dishonest. Yeah, it, it's that whole thing of like, oh, you, you know, I, I come from the business sector and, and, and you know, you've got to run the country like a business, which is wrong. Um, or you've got to run the, the, the country like a household, which is also wrong. But in either of those two examples, you don't, selling off your assets is, yeah. is like the last fucking thing you do. Yeah, they're gone forever. And, and they, it, it, it's so obvious and there's been so many cycles of it happening when a government has to sell the silverware, the mates of the people selling it 
are, are the ones that are lining up for it. Yeah. Like, can we not do that again, please? Yeah. Um, I can see your image down there. Why don't we wait for that? Because oh, okay, well, let's do it right now. I was going to say we'll do it after right. the story, but there we go. Um, looking it, a bit brown. It, it, looking a bit. It is looking haggard. <laughs> um. So what are we at now? Five, ten, seventeen. Seventeen days. And it's more than that if you include from election night, but that was from the the votes, wasn't it? When the yeah, official yeah. vote count came through. Um, yeah, Simon Simon here says uh, thinking it's tax cuts. I mean, I guess it's I, I when it's you, when you say tax cuts, I just think foreign buyers tax as a part of that. I mean, mm. basically, without that, it's the tax cuts. So I guess that's sort of I think those kind of go hand in hand. It, hand he's money. hammered tax cuts. It it, it is his flagship policy it's what got them across the line but what didn't is how i'm going to pay for them yeah all right let's go into the first story now which is uh, off uh, one news tonight uh we've often talked about mr luxon having that kind of ceo vibe everything's good everything's on the up and up da -da 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 -da. um what happens tonight when uh mr luxon gives gives headline news to the country about a coalition breakthrough. He hasn't told the other two people about this. And both Seymour and Winston are a bit like, oh, in fact, Winston goes into the, oh yeah, that's all a bit, a bit of conjecture, is it? And it's like, no, no, Luxon has said this. Um, but you know what I thought when I saw this, Chewie, before we play it? It is the CEO thing. It's like, I've talked mm -hmm. to my managers, now I'm going to make the announcement. You know what I mean? It's it's completely and both Luxon and uh, sorry uh, both Seymour and Peters get caught out, and uh, because Winston's always on the attack, when he hears something that he doesn't know, he immediately thinks it's bullshit from the media, and then he has to backtrack. But of course he won't. He still ends up saying no, no, no. It wasn't what you said when it was. He just oh. refuses to believe it. So let's have a look at this uh, debacle of a coalition situation we're going through at the moment. Uh, with, as someone said in the chat, the three-headed Hydra um, and the uh, coalition breakthrough that only one person apparently knew about. There's just a couple more steps to go. That's David Seymour's response after Christopher Luxon said National has agreed on policy programs with ACT and New Zealand First. There was some mixed messaging from the three leaders today on how close they are to finally signing off a coalition deal. Here's Deputy Political Editor Mikey Sherman with the latest on the negotiations. Hi, Mikey. There was no raining on Christopher Luxon's parade today. The Prime oh, Minister to be finally pack. bearing some oh, good. Is that big? Is that a, was it a joke? You're the comedian. Was that because it's raining? It, it was. It, it's joke adjacent. No. It, it's kind of a pun, <laughs> but it's it's backed up by the fact that visual, like she said the words, and then right. visually it's raining. No. So See, it, that's 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 why I'll never get that. I'll never get this comedy thing. It's too detailed. I don't. I can't figure it out. Good news. We've achieved, I think, a significant milestone overnight, and that is that we have actually closed out and agreed our policy programs with both ACT and also with New Zealand First. Agreement after 17 agonising days of negotiations, flitting between Wellington and Auckland as the parties went line by line through each of their manifestos. We've worked our way through all the policy positions and the differences and the different mechanics for achieving the same or different goals. So correct me if I'm wrong, Chewie. What Luxon's saying is we are we have no more policy things to agree on. They're all done. That's what I'm hearing. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's been starting, right? So why is he not uh, announcing anything? Well, what happens after the, the leaders agree is then it has to go to their boards. So I get that there is a step. But what oh, it okay. sounds like he's saying is everything's done and dusted, bar the what do they say? Bar the shouting? Is that the thing? This is probably yeah, appropriate yeah, if yeah. Winston Peters is involved. Um, so it sounds like he said, we've agreed to everything. It's imminent. That's the vibe I get from him. It's not the same vibe you get from the other two. Goals. There were plenty of sticking points. It's understood New Zealand first rejected National's plan, allowing foreign buyers back into no the housing shit. market, while ACT's treaty referendum Shocking. was also put in the too hard basket. Look, I mean, all three parties have had to make trade-offs along the way. That will be revealed when we make our final announcement. Today's public update, though, seems to have been a surprise to some. You're making an assumption and... Uh, Mr. That, Luxon that, revealing to media... See, this is Winston going on the attack. You're making an assumption, You're, but it, but Luxon's already announced it. It's, it's it's pretty embarrassing for Winston. They'd reached a deal. Well, yes, but... But didn't give his new mates the heads up. 
Look, I'll tell you later on. I, I suspect Chris got up and had one too many wheat picks, but I can understand his enthusiasm. Ah. There's just a couple more steps to go. Actor New Zealand first met today, finally laying eyes on each other's arrangements. Oh, look, we had a... Now, isn't that shocking? They met today, finally laying eyes on the other's arrangements. That means they hadn't seen it before today. Day 17 was the first time, according to the report, that ACT saw New Zealand firsts and New Zealand firsts saw ACT's what they want and what they're prepared to give up. Day 17, Chewy. But remember, master negotiator, master, master something. Uh, we had a really good chat. We're talking about policy. We're talking about uh, the agreement. There's a, a whole lot of things that um, you know we need to work through. We want them to be able to support each other's programs. We want all three parties to be able to support all three policy programs and agendas that we have. Pressure has been building to get a deal across the line. For businesses, it's extremely frustrating. The economy is still really in a dire straits. We've got uh, the cost of living crisis, inflation still there, retail spending is down. For business, time really is money, waiting on policy promises like scrapping fair pay agreements within the first 100 days. So what we're really wanting to see is all of those promises made. Because that's what we want a government to do, get rid of our workers mm. getting fair pay. I mean, that's exactly what yep. we want to do. Eh? No more fair pay. Uh, what we want is to be able to screw you down and uh, make it as difficult as possible for you to get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Let's just get rid of those fucking things. If, if what... you're an employee and you voted for national, fuck. That's that's what you've done. To yourself and all your fellow co-workers. Yep. Well done, you. Well done, you. Made on the campaign trail to start getting enacted. And I really do appreciate everybody's patience with the process, but I do believe it'll actually make for a much stronger government. But first, getting on the same page, Winston Peters finally receiving the update from Christopher Luxon. I want to now remember, remember what we said? This is Winston Peters. Now we should go, oh yeah, no, sorry, you're right. I did get the update from it, but Winston doesn't know and can never take a backward step. So he comes out and says... For Luxon. I want to find out from him that what you said he said was actually true. And I found out it wasn't. Well, an update of sorts. So it wasn't. So in other words, I disagree with how you've packaged what Luxon has said, even though they packaged it fairly. And so he just refused to back down. Now, now think about that as a character, right? On Winston Peters, it has to be dealt with mm. by ACT and National for the next three years. Never back down. Even Look, the water's wet. Nope. No, no, water's wet. Nope. I checked, I'll tell you where I, I, checked, I checked with the scientists to see if what you were saying was correct, and it's not. No, no, it's, it's that's there's Winston Peters for you. So, what are your thoughts, like, Joey, at, of the coalition out of, of those chaos? Three statements, like as far as you have to speak to the media during a negotiation, do you know who did the best job there? David fucking Seymour. <laughs> like, say some words. Don't commit yourself to anything. And more importantly, don't commit your negotiation partners to a position or a point of view either. Just keep it light and airy. Luxon is bad at this because he's a rookie. He's learning on the job. He's still in his trial period. Um, but he he's going at like it'd be like if if he was in business and he was taking over a company running and telling all of his shareholders the deal's done before the other guys have told their team what's happened. You would not do it. That would tank a deal. Yeah. And it's like he he can't do it. He he doesn't know who he's working with. He has probably not taken on board anything that he's been told about dealing with Winston Peters, <laughs> which is just shut the fuck up until you have everything locked down because the media will go to Winston and Winston will make a big song and dance out of all of it. So just don't give it to him. What you've basically got, and this is where he needs to learn, and I'm going to try and be generous rather than saying he's shit at it, which he could also say, but needs to learn, hmm. is basically what he's got is three CEOs of equal standing. That's the equivalent that he's got. So he's yeah, not the CEO. He's got... He, it, well, yeah, and, and like David Hooten, um, David, Matthew Hooten said last week, we're going to play a clip from Matthew Hooten this week and he might say it again. But like he said last week, in a, in a merger or in a business takeover, it's the big one that can walk away because it doesn't impact them. It's normally the littler company that actually loses out if you don't merger. This is the other way around. 
So it's actually completely foreign territory to someone who's used to checking in with his managers, but doing what he wants and also being in the position of power because he's not, it doesn't matter that he's the biggest party. He's not the one in power because the other two could comfortably sit across the benches and screw Luxon completely. He's actually the weakest of the three. I'm not saying when it comes to passing policy, he's got the most MPs, but when it comes to this negotiation and he he's, I mean, like, I should be generous and say most of us have never done that before, but because he sold his negotiation skills, his merger skills, and his CEO-ness as a reason he can do it, that's why we criticize him more than we would criticize, let's say, a John Key who probably hadn't done it either before, but he never really sold it as as strongly as Luxon has, in my opinion, Chewie. Yeah, he's been in such a, a, a hurry to justify a whole bunch of stuff. That again, like th this is this has been an election of leaders painting themselves into corners. Yeah, including like, this, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, Hickens did a, did a lot of it, um, but yeah, th this is this is Luxon doing it himself as well, and just being completely unaware of the positions that he's taken and how the optics are going to be when when the tables turned. Yeah, you go on about wasteful government spending. I, I noticed now that they, they've they've gone back to their offices and stuff like that. They're not necessarily using the hotel as much anymore, um, because you can't spend six months going on about wasteful government spending and then spend a week answering questions about how much is being spent on this negotiation by going parliamentary services are cool with it. So I don't think it's a big issue. Yeah. I mean, it's, that, that's going to be a fan, that's going to be a fantastic, um, you know, uh, I always think for your request, freedom of information act request. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's what it's called in New Zealand as to how much these negotiations have cost. Cause remember the criticism of the left of the labor government was wasteful spending. This will cost a hundred grand. Like all up, this will be $100,000 in my opinion, my honest held belief. It'll be $100,000 to do this negotiations. And most, I mean, like most of us, probably me included, would be like, oh, well, if that's what it costs to get this done, fine. But we have to continue to measure them by their standard of labor. It's essential that we keep measuring, especially ACT and especially national, based on their standard that they want to hold labor to right at the very least that's what we need to hold them to and if labor spent let's be generous 30 40 50 100 grand on on let's say um talks with the greens over a, a something they would rip them a new one what's the difference there's a, we're coming into periods where like government departments being told that they can't have an end of year function or people are going to lose their jobs right before Christmas because government spending is out of control. You can't hold these two things in, in, in your mind at the same time. The other thing is it's optics. Like on one hand, yes, if they haven't been making statements about how wasteful government spending is, is out of control and just obscene, the cost of living crisis, rah, 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 squeeze middle. If they hadn't been going on about that, I literally would not care where they met. Because it's, yeah, sure, I understand. You've got to do a negotiation. Sure, do it wherever you want. But because you've taken those positions, then people are going to ask those questions. Now, if yep. you know that, a savvy political operator, and they can't all be political dimwits, someone in that room is going, don't know if we should have it at $1,000 a day in a, in, in a hotel, you know, pulling that number out of thin air. No, no, that's what no, no, that's that's been reported. It's been reported a thousand dollars just oh. for the comp, just just for the room, a thousand bucks a day. That's been reported. Catering and flights, yeah, and all much of that. more than that. If you know that that's what you're going to be counted on, it front foot it. We're having our treaty negotiation, our, our coalition negotiations, in a community hall, somewhere between our three electorates. You know that it, it's costing us. $50 a day. We're ordering <laughs> dominoes. You know, it's like, look, because we we know New Zealand that you're doing it tough. So we, we're we going to do that as well. It might be performative as all fuck, but it's it, like, it's optics. You can no, listen, optics. no, no, you've said it perfectly because all the way through the election cycle, ACT in particular, David Seymour was, oh, you know, your regular, your regular New Zealander has to tighten their belt. So the government should too, literally what was being said. Hmm. Kiwis are struggling to pay the bills. So they're tightening their belts. The government should too, except for when we want to negotiate for 17 days at a cost of $57,000. I don't know, whatever it costs.
So yeah, no, it's completely fair. It's completely fair. Um, let's suck up the super chat from JC. Thank you for the super chat. Very generous. 20 bucks. Uh, on economic economic ideals, Winston and Seymour differ markedly. Winston will stand strong on tax and assets as an economic nationalist. Silver lining is this shit show for those of us on the left. Look, it's it's actually, JC, what you're saying on some level I resonate with, but then I take a step back and I go, actually, this shit show though is not good for the country. Like my my sadist side goes, ah, this is fantastic. But then I take a step back and I go, but for the country. And when it comes to workers' rights and stuff, and, and as someone mentioned in the chat, which we didn't bring up then, um, you know, the 90-day um, testing timetabling thing coming back. So it's not good for them. So yeah, on some level, one half of my brain goes, oh man, I hope Winston makes it a complete balls up for the other two. But on the other half of my brain, I'm kind of going, man, but what this is going to do for the vulnerable, the average, you know, average New Zealander, maybe if they get their way for Maori, it's not good. It's not good. And that's, I think all of us need to keep that at the forefront of our mind. If that's if that's the forefront of our mind and the byproduct at the back is like, ha suckers, I think that's okay. But if what's at the forefront of our mind, our main thought is, ha suckers, then we're kind of missing the point that how bad this is going to be for some people. I just, you know, just a heads up. That's what I would think at least anyway. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, that's hard for, for people doing, you know, essentially what we're doing, right, where politics can be a, a bit of a blood sport and you want to you want to point score it. But it's not our blood. And it's not their yeah. blood either. yeah. So yeah, good. All right, good. Thing well, to keep that in mind. We've been talking about um, Luxo. I called him C Lux in a text the other day, and someone said to me that my uh, in a tweet I should say. Someone said that my my um, it was like disrespect for him by using a pejorative of C Lux, and it was nothing like that. It was just like this, you know, you know, like someone called Chris Hopkins. Uh. Chip, chip, Someone called Chris Hipkins on the show Chipkins, and we thought that was hilarious. And we called him that for a while. I don't think C Lux is too bad. Anyway, um, I didn't use it, it in the class. What what was that person's opinion of Cindy? Oh, yeah, it's very true. Um, but talk, seeing we're talking about C Lux, um, Matthew Hooten on News Hub Nation in the weekend, kind of talking about how this is all going. And you know he's not a fan of Luxon. Like, let's put that out there to start with if you're a, if you're a Luxo flake. That should be the, you know how you have your 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 name for your, your groupies? The Luxo Flakes. That's quite good. So the Luxo Flakes who love Sea Lux. Um yeah, look, he's he's this this it's it's pretty well known that Hooten pretty much despises Christopher Lux. And he does some, to be fair, in this conversation, but it is a bit of a conversation around who Luxon is and how Hooten sees him performing in this coalition. Let's have a listen. <laughs> not how it was supposed to go, is it? Christopher Luxon should be at APEC this week, but he is right now in uh, limbo land. Well, it has been a humiliating five weeks for Christopher. Um, you know, he said on the day after the election that he was a man of action, uh, that he knew about mergers and acquisitions, that he knew about negotiations, and he was going to get cracking and that they were going to start that afternoon with his, his meeting with his strategy people, and none of that's happened. But Perhaps, um, to be fair to him, what's gone, going on is he's prepared to suffer those humiliations uh, in order to focus on the content. And if he comes out with a deal where National maintains control of fiscal policy, of tax policy, the broad direction of foreign policy, the appointment of judges, uh, controls Auditor General's office, state's uh, the Public Service Commission, SFO, mm -hmm. uh, and and those sorts of things, and doesn't unravel the Treaty of Waitangi settlement process, which National has led for 30 years, then the humiliations will have been worth it. And he'll The obvious point is he won't get all those things. Now, no, uh, we watch sometimes Hooten can't. when he goes on Bomber's show, and he uses much more direct, uh, sarcastic, um, <laughs> mean language. He's being a bit more reserved on, you know, terrestrial television but i think one of the points here is he won't get all those things so the embarrassment is just an embarrassment and nothing else hoe yeah absolutely yeah he's, he's not going to get everything that he wants that's what a negotiation is yeah absolutely and he's he's definitely going to lose his big one which is the mm. uh, foreign buyers ban and then of course the question by the media for the next six months is going to be how are you going to pay for tax cuts how are you going to pay for it he's put as you've said very wisely chewy most of the leaders, if not all of them, perhaps not the Greens if I think about it, but maybe we could come up with one, have painted themselves into corners. National and their tax cuts based on foreign buyers' tax take is 
them painting themselves into a corner. Refusing to answer questions about what happens if you can't get over the line has painted them into a corner because what they've said is basically no matter what, we're doing these tax cuts. That's painting themselves into a corner. Act has painted themselves into a corner because no matter what, they're doing a treaty on the referendum. Um, I actually saw something somewhere the other day. I can't remember where I saw it, Chewy. Um, maybe it was public. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a tweet. Maybe it was. I genuinely can't remember what it was, but someone saying that the word on the street, this is like an inside word on the street, is that ACT has been funded a huge amount of money to do a, uh, a citizens-initiated referendum on the treaty if they lose the ability mm -hmm. to do it through um, coalition. Now, I honestly and genuinely can't remember who said that. It might have been someone to me behind the scenes, <laughs> which is why I'm not giving any credit for it, but it was a reputable source um, saying a, uh, a, you know, a citizens initiate a referendum on the principles of the treaty or on the treaty or on however it gets worded uh, is something that someone or some entities are funding act for, for when it doesn't get over the line in the coalition. So we'll watch the space. I, I had seen chatter about that as well. Yeah. All right. All right. Who have made the right judgment to suffer those humiliations in exchange for good policy. And actually, in the end, it won't um, It won't necessarily be totally, you know, it's not necessarily, he won't perhaps sell it as being humiliating. This is part of politics. It's part of coalition deals. He's talked about his um, mergers and acquisitions experience. But actually, coalition building is entirely different, isn't it? Well, it is because it's the big party that must close. I mean, if you were at Unilever and you were buying a couple of small companies, um, you know, Unilever can walk away, as Christopher Luxon did from the, uh, the Virgin Australia deal. And, but you can't, because this would be like, if those small parties don't agree to merge with you, then Unilever goes broke. <laughs> and so the dynamics are completely different. And I'm not sure that he understood that. I'm not sure, he under he, because remember, he left New Zealand in 1995. Before the first MNP election, he didn't come back till John Key was Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, so he didn't see the 96 situation or the 2005 situation. And, and I don't think he right. really thought through that it was he who was the only one that had to do the deal. Winston Peters and David Seymour, they could still walk away now if they choose. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good point by Matthew Houghton. You know, he's been away for such a long time. And obviously, as a New Zealander, you will keep an eye on what's happening back in New Zealand. But if your line of work has got you busy every day, all day, you're not going to be watching it like you could. So he's really not seen MMP in New Zealand, included, including Winston Peters, because that's a big part of 1996, remember? So MMP, mm. including Winston Peters, in action in New Zealand, uh, really ever before. So, yeah, and look, Houghton's saying just what we've been saying. I mean, to be fair, we're probably taking some of our cues from his commentary through the time as well about this is a, such a different story uh, than Luxon, the CEO. Luxon, the CEO of a company uh, negotiating uh, with another business is is night and day. It's just because the word negotiating is in there doesn't mean it's anything alike. You know, like a, a fruit salad is nothing like a Caesar salad. Just because they've both got the word salad in them doesn't mean they're anything alike. Negotiating with a business and negotiating for a political party. They've got the word negotiation in them, but they are nothing alike. Um, and I think that's what Luxon's figuring out right now, Joey. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, he's been gone too long. He doesn't have the experience for it. And we're seeing this play out live. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, National Voters. Absolutely. And, it, you know, it does sound like it has been a really tough process um, going on behind those four walls. Um, and it's a tough spot that Christopher Luxon finds himself in, particularly with that foreign buyer's tax, isn't it? Because yep. National never factored in, working with Winston Peters probably on its way through its policy development. And yet here he is at the table. There was no sort of risk analysis for that, no plan B. Because they left the I... door open. Yeah, that's it. They didn't plan for having to work with Winston I've Peters. Done this and, to themselves. and then they got Winston Peters the bump to get him in by ruling him in. So they didn't they didn't think about getting him in there. And then they helped him get in there. Remember, it was like, um, I'm not going to rule him in or out, followed by uh, I'm going to rule him in, followed by weeks of going, please don't vote for him. That was Luxon's experience. I'm not I refuse to rule him out. I am going to rule him in. Now please don't vote for him because it'll be trouble. Hello, an experience. I actually um think again to be fair to Christopher. Mm. Um, I, is, it, is it just me or anytime Hooten says the word Christopher, it does sound like a teacher scolding a young child? Uh, well, just a little bit, eh? Just a little bit. <laughs> I think it's in his advantage the way this has um, turned out because that was a ridiculous policy. It was written by 
property development industry, Sky City Casino. I mean, it didn't, it, it, every economist oh, criticised it. Again. It, yeah. didn't, it wasn't fully funded. National says its team came up with the plan. but No, but this is very true. I think what, like, uh, what Hooten's going on to say is this could actually be quite a good exit from a policy that was never going to work. Luxon can get up and go, we want to do this. We think it's right. We've done the numbers. You can't say it wasn't going to work because unfortunately we're not going to be able to do it. We had to give it away. And it might actually be his way out of a policy that was never, ever, 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 ever times a million going to work. So he might have found his out to save face on some level, even though he's losing face by losing it to these two, saving face by never having to put it to the test and failing with it. So might be a some some total gain for uh, the National Party not being able to do it. But it was widely criticised mm. by... Well, um, it, 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 it was going to be highly inflationary. It was going to introduce 20-something billion dollars of extra demand into our economy, which is why ACT opposed it. Uh, obviously, New Zealand First can't allow that foreign buyer ban to be lifted. Mm. Uh, and I think he gets to avoid it because it would have been terribly inflationary and um, would have done significant damage to the economy, raised interest rates had it gone ahead, and now he's got an excuse for it not to go ahead. Yeah. Well, those are all... Exactly. Great point, too, and I guess I stole it off uh, Houston, but very true. You know, he's looking for an out. He's now got an out. He doesn't have to do it. So he can now he can, he can now bluster and, oh, you know, we, we knew this would have worked and it was costed and it's all good, but, you know, we couldn't test it because everyone has to give up something, and it means they've actually got out, got out of jail scot-free by not having to do something that would have failed, Chewy. No, I, I agree. I do. Oh, Hooten annoys me a lot of the time, a lot of the time, but I yeah. do like it when he turns on his team because he personally doesn't like someone. Um, you know, he has a, a fair amount of, of blame for, I think, the things that we've mocked for National for over the last couple of years. Wasn't he behind um, Todd Muller's run? I believe so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, as much as I don't trust the guy, yeah, when he's right, I think he's right. Um, I think he has really put his finger on something that the, the National Party has not found a solution for that has been years and years in the making. Mm -hmm. That, like, any time we you and uh, when you describe some of the people that are involved in the negotiations as the National Brain Trust, yeah, that and it includes mother. Simeon Brown, <laughs> what the fuck is going on there? I assume he, he just comes in to bring in the biscuits, but, uh, <laughs> I, you know, if he's being asked for policy, that's, that's a tremendous worry. If you don't know too much about Simeon Brown, but you've seen the movie the castle the character i think his name was da <laughs> i think the character's name was daryl dug another hole dad good on you boy that's simeon brown and the hole that he's dug will be a pot here. will be a pothole dug another pothole dad <laughs> good on you son well done hey um <laughs> thanks for the um thanks for the super chat chris if luxon said he was picking up the bill or even half the bill for these fancy hotel meetings people would think more positively about him. And yeah, look, I'll, I want to say this again. I, 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 will, I will not, I refuse to stop beating this horse, right? This dead horse. Is that I actually don't have a problem with political parties needing to spend a, what most citizens would consider a significant amount of money to, to nut this out. What I do care about is holding these two parties accountable to at least the same level they decided they had to hold Labour to. And that's simply a waste is a waste is a waste. I'll say it again. Uh, ex David Seymour, New Zealanders are tightening their belts, so should we. Ah, oh, let's just spend fifty thousand dollars when we've got offices in Auckland, homes in Auckland, and cheaper locations we could have used in Auckland. So they're not doing, they're not living to the standard that they set for the Labour government. That's my criticism. Go it's, to it. it's hypocrisy. We all we should all hate the hypocrisy wherever it shows up, especially in politics. Um, because we're talking about Simeon Brown and because they haven't done this for a while. My favourite photo of Simeon Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dad. I'm in the car with Dad. Dad's Mark, driving my car. car the big, I'm in the big car with Dad. Hi, Dad. <laughs> We're getting ice creams because my record. I have to get ice cream. Good. Dad said I could have a big boy ice cream today. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit it's disrespectful. Just, it's just my favourite. 
I've finally got oh. to go and buy some long pants. I've been in shorts all the time. Dad's taking me to buy my first <laughs> set of long pants. I am um, very disrespectful. I do apologize. Hey, uh, big thanks to all our patrons. I, I, uh, love you guys to bits. If you want to be involved with what we do, if you want to get behind what we do and help us uh, pay the odd bill here or there, very simple. You can just head to patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. Uh, a bunch of pe new people on there since we had a little chat last week. Appreciate that. Great guys. You're, you're lovely. We love you to bits. And uh, thank you for being involved. Uh, patreon.com forward slash big hairy news to be a part of the team. Uh, we'll probably have a meetup this Saturday. So if you want to come along to the meetup, now a meetup we do is virtual. We basically get on Zoom and have a meetup with whoever wants to come along. Uh, you'll just need to be a, a patron before Thursday night. I might send a link out tomorrow, but if anyone joins before, uh, like after tomorrow, but before Thursday night or Friday night, I'll, I'll send it to you once it actually happens. And I don't know, maybe we'll finally get Chewy at one of these things. Probably not, but maybe we will. Chewy's time is valuable, eh, Chewy? you got to pay to get the ginger, I, man. So, so valuable. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's keep going. Now, shut your eyes, Chewy. Shut your eyes. Keep them and keep them shut. Right? I'll tell you, I'll tell you when you can when you can open them. All right. Shut your eyes, keep them shut, and open them. Ah! It's Jerry Brownley. I don't know what it happened to Jerry Brownley. Brownlee. I don't God. I honestly don't Look, I don't know what happened. When I am in power. This is yep. my promise to you. Yep. Yep. That I will never do an interview from a car because I don't. Jerry Brownlee could be a bodybuilder. He's still going to look like a potato on a phone camera in his car. Yeah. Do you know what it is? What it is? It's this, right? Let me show you. It's this. It's the shoulders being up. Oh, it doesn't. It's, it doesn't it's help. The suit, the suit jacket pushing yeah. up. Makes it look like he's got even less neck than he has. Yeah. I got a bit like, of criticism from a few like, nice people today, and fair enough too, because I think I tweeted out something like, what happened to Jerry Brownlee? Is it hot where he is? Why is he melting? Because I just looked at that photo, and it looked like Jerry Brownlee, but it, but like made of wax, and it started to melt. I got in trouble for saying that by a couple of people on mm. Twitter. And you're right. It was a bit mean. But remember, I've been fat. I am fat. I can mock it. I'm allowed to. I have that pass. Like some people are allowed to say, like, like gay people can use the F word. You know, I I can I can make jokes about being obese. I'm allowed. I have the, I, I have the. I, I try very hard, and I'm not I'm not going to say that I am 100 percent successful at this all, all the time. But criticizing politicians by their looks, like because I did not like it when people went after people that I I rate, and you know when people went after Paula Bennett, like. Paula Bennett has so there's, there's a wide variety of things that you can criticize Paula Bennett for. Yep. It, without even touching on her figure or how she looks. And I think the same is true of Jerry Brownlee. Yeah. I think there's a lot that you can criticize this this guy for without mentioning his size. Yep. But yeah, this is this is more a like if you are going to be on it's, the about the it's about the framing. It's about the framing of the shot. Like, like, like I'll tell I, I, like I'll, I'll tell you something. You in your car. Yeah, I'll tell you something though. When I when I do pre-recorded interviews and people sit in front of their laptops and they look like that, I go, no, no, no. We want you to look as best you can. Tilt tilt your screen forward a bit, fill up the screen, get your head. Clock. I actually sh I I give them a chance to set it up properly so they can look as best they can. TVNZ's done them dirty a little bit here. We're just going, yeah, fuck that'll do. Let's get Jerry on, not a problem, because they should they should have get no no, but lower, but okay now, yep now. And he's also looking up, look down a little bit. You know, they could have helped him a bit. Anyway, mm -hmm. let's get on to the substance of this conversation rather than just waxing Agent. lyrical. Agent time. Um, so this is talking to Jerry Brownlee about Christopher Hipkins coming out and finally, in my opinion, calling for a ceasefire. Of course, the hubbub was that he shouldn't have done it because he was the leader of the opposition, who was also the acting prime minister, but the, this is how it's been set up that that um he approached the the uh incoming prime minister who said they'd get back to them who then didn't get back to them who we know is sitting on the fence now about israel and gaza and then they gave them a heads up they were going to do it not as the prime minister but as the leader of labor and so that's the heads up for the story and this is jerry brownlee responding to that there's one really important part for you guys to hear and see that tells all you need to know about national and calling for a ceasefire. And I'll point it out when it comes up. 
two for the standing Prime Minister to break, to break out and speak out on behalf of the party. Um, you're calling Mr Hipkins out. Why? System of uh, politics. You know, what, I've, what I've responded to uh, is his suggestion that we were consulted uh, and, and disagreed with their position. The reality is that uh, on Friday... So he's responding to them not disagreeing. So therefore, do you agree, Mr Brownlee? So he's responding to that. With him, with Hipkins saying that we disagree with his position, right? That's a part of it. Really important to to hear what he says. Hey, there was a change from that position that Mr. Hipkins uh, was articulating in your opening uh, comments, and, um, and we we asked for what was the MFAT advice, that's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade advice at this point. And they came back with a lengthy document. It had three options in it. Uh, and uh, we preferred option one in that, which was that we uh, move in lockstep with Australia and Canada, uh, of course wanting a ceasefire, of course wanting an end to, to hostility. So he's saying National wants a ceasefire. Do you get that, Chewy? Of course wanting a ceasefire. Hang on, isn't that what Mr Hipkins said? He says, of course wanting a ceasefire. Uh, but recognising that there are steps that need to be taken to get there uh, and that uh, we, we want to support uh, that process to get a good outcome for the appalling situation that's on the ground in Gaza. Yep, so you want a ceasefire, but yep, we said. had Christopher Luxon on this programme previously. He hasn't directly said that that's what he is calling for. So is that National's position? Uh, the position is we think that the, the various uh, conditions that need to be met by both parties here. But this is the really important part. What right? fuck? No, this just stick with me. This is really important, and this will show you exactly what National's doing. Conditions that both parties need to adhere to. That's what he said, right? He said that National's position, we'll, we'll go back and get it word for word, but I'm paraphrasing it. National's position is calling for the ceasefire, but there are some conditions that both sides need to meet. Have a listen again. Uh, the position is we think that the the various uh, conditions that need to be met by both parties both here, parties. both Hamas and uh, uh, the Israeli Defence Force, uh, need to be recognised and worked uh, through. One of the problems you've got, of course, is that Hamas is a terrorist organisation. So who are you negotiating with, I guess, is a bit of a problem. Uh, but we have heard, uh, and the Washington Post was reporting yesterday, uh, that a five-day ceasefire might be, uh, or, you know, a slowdown, if you like, uh, might be possible. And we would certainly welcome that. Uh, and the, the the outcome everyone wants is to have a complete uh, uh, end to these hostilities. You, you mentioned uh, conditions. This is the perfect question. So Jenny May is going to go, what are these conditions? Because remember what he said, I'm going to remind you of it, even though he's just said it, that both parties, there are conditions that both parties, that means Israel and Hamas, need to meet for the ceasefire. Both parties, Jenny May is about to ask the perfect question, what are those conditions? In your last answer, and in a, in a release that came out yesterday, it says National supports the goal of a ceasefire, but acknowledge that conditions have not existed for one so far. When you talk about those conditions, what are you talking about? Remember, the conditions, as he said, that both parties need to meet. Now, Chewy, you might be surprised. Jerry Brownlee's now asked to expand on what are the what are the conditions that both parties, both parties need to meet. He's very forthcoming with the conditions that Hamas needs to uh, needs to meet. But guess who he doesn't talk about having any conditions to meet? The other party. So on one hand, he's saying both parties have to meet the conditions, but when asked to explain it, all he talks is about the conditions that Hamas needs to meet. Mr. Brownlee? Primarily the release of the hostages uh, and the uh, um, Which hostages? stop using uh, the, the population of Gaza as some kind of, some kind of human shield. It's uh, look. The whole situation is utterly appalling. That's it. Um, and there needs to be right. uh, a recognition that that, that hold yourself, uh, Chewie. The come back terrorist organisation that attacked oh Israel in the first place uh, is now using the people of Gaza uh, to to further their own ends. And I think you know supposedly in support of them, and that those sort of things need to be uh, set aside. There does need to be a uh, a dialogue and uh, you know the, the saddest thing is a lot of people are dying while all this is going on hmm. now I didn't want to cut that last answer short because I didn't want someone to then say to me what well, he would have mentioned the conditions later on he said 
very clearly there are conditions that both parties need to meet. Jenny May, please, Mr. Brownlee, explain the conditions that need to be met. Well, Hamas has to do this and this and this. I thought it was both parties. And unfortunately, Jenny May didn't follow up with the question, which I would have done. Okay, so that's the condition of Hamas. What are the conditions that Israel has to meet? Now, let me make this clear um, for you people out there who, who think we are uh, pro-terrorists. Again, we have stated blatantly and openly that what Hamas has done is an act of war. Put it on the table. However, if someone's going to say, a politician's going to say, now, Labour has said they want a ceasefire. What do you want? And then it's basically say 20 different ways we want a ceasefire, but refuse to say the words we call for a ceasefire. 20 different ways say there's responsibility on both sides, but only points to one side. Then that is a bias within this new upcoming government that is pretty scary to me, Joey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Oh, Hamas are going to do this, 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 and this. IDF must cease combat operations for a period of five days, six, six days, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, they must allow aid combat convoys through fuel, food, medicine. Um, they must release the civilian captives that they have in Israeli prisons at the moment. You know, there, there's there's lots that you can say there. They all seem to be tripping over themselves that if they don't frame this in the same in the right way, that will be an international pariah. That would, would have all fucked up it. These guys think that New Zealand is too small to matter, but then when it comes to something like this are paralyzed by the potential for saying something incorrectly. If they keep this simple, you can do it. You can just go, we call for a ceasefire. Why, why do we need to wait for Australia or for Canada? Like, we're our own country, right? We set our own foreign policy. It's a good idea to run things past our friends and allies, absolutely. But the, Brownlee started by saying, oh, we'll, we'll just say what Australia and Canada say. They'll tell us what to say. And what if they call like, for a ceasefire? It's, what it's, would be, you know, oh, it's, it's very difficult. You know, there's mm -hmm. lots of moving. But yes, we know there's lots of moving parts in, in a negotiation in, in, in this. It's a notoriously difficult part of the world. You don't need to talk about it. But you can go ceasefire now. Don't care how. We want a ceasefire because every day that this continues, more children die. That's we, the we've, statement. We've got another clip to play with Chloe Swarbrick talking to um, David Seymour from uh, one of the breakfast shows this morning. And look, we are going to go beyond 10 o'clock, obviously. It's a Monday. We always do. I wasn't going to play I wasn't going to play any more of that interview, Chewy, but you've just said something that's caused me to have to play the last kind of 70 seconds of it um, because guess where he goes? He goes almost exactly what you've just said. What what do they think New Zealand will say about all of this? Mr. Brownlee, I just want to wrap things up. And um, yesterday, Chris Hipkins says it's been five weeks. I would have articulated the Labour Party's position earlier, but I have been caretaker prime minister. He went on to say he's been waiting five weeks for the government to sort itself out. And in the meantime, he has been unable to speak out, given his role as the stand-in prime minister. Doesn't he have a point here? There is, there is a real unrest here in New Zealand about a lack of response from our major parties. And isn't this a time to show leadership, Mr. Brownlee? Yes. Well, two points. There has been continuous response uh, from the uh, caretaker government. I think you mean from the Greens. There's been continuous response from the Greens. <laughs> I think I think that's yeah. what uh, uh, the Greens aren't the caretaker com uh, government, Mr. Brownlee. But that's what you mean to say. There's been a continuous response from from the Greens uh, and the the incoming government. Uh, and that is what Mr. Hipkins was articulating at the start, articulating at the start of your uh, article today. Uh, the second thing is that it didn't uh, prevent him uh, from going out as Labour leader and taking a position yesterday. Uh, I think that the... Well, then shut the fuck up about complaining about it. You've just said he can do it. He's done it. So what are you whinging about? But difficulty yesterday was that his accusation that uh, we had not supported a ceasefire. Of course, we want a ceasefire. Uh, but I think recognise that New Zealand is not going to be one of the countries that can make an immediate difference here. Uh, we oh, have to be in lockstep go. with others so, why bother? so that we are moving towards the goal that we all want. Exactly. We're too small, so why bother? Mr what Brownlee, fucking pathetic nuclear-free in the 1980s, following your idea 
doesn't matter. What about what about anti-apartheid marches in the 1980s? According to your principles, can't do anything. Uh, what about women in the vote? According to your principles, nah, doesn't matter. Doesn't can't matter. Imp- influence the world. And I'll tell you what, I, I, didn't, doing it. I didn't feel this earlier, Chewie, but I'm fuming. Like, I'm actually really, really, really angry right now because this kind of bullshit, and, and Chloe Swarbrick does a very good job in a minute of interviewing David Seymour and asking him questions that the media won't. I, I'm, I don't want to criticize Jenny May because it's a media thing. Big, big, big holes in the conversations. Like, I, I could never, not that I would ever get asked, but I could never work for a plus like this because I, I don't know how I'd stop going, you're fucking kidding, right? Are you, are you fucking serious? <laughs> like, I just don't I know how, how how you wouldn't do it. Like, dude, okay, so so you've, you've said about Hamas, what about Israel? No, 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 come on. You said both sides. You said mm-hmm. both sides both parties have conditions. What are the conditions of Israel? And let me say this. I uh, people, have, people will criticize this as being oversimplified. If Israel said it's a five-day ceasefire, right? If one rocket comes across the, the border before the five days is up, then we're resuming. Or if the prisoners or the hostages aren't released by the end of that five days, then we're resuming. Then you know what? People like me, I'm not saying I would jump in their camp straight away, but I'd be like, well, what do you expect, Hamas? They gave you the opportunity and you couldn't do it. I'm not mm. saying that would then solve everything, but they just won't. They just will not do it, Joey. It, it's wait, you've listed off a lot of the political aspects. So you've forced me into a corner of listing off all the sporting analogies. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're a small country, so there's no point in hand building a motorcycle and taking it to the salt flats and breaking land speed record. Yep. You know, we're a small country with no money. There's there's no way that we can compete in the America's Cup. I mean, it's it's called the America's Cup. Why bother? You know, it's 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 just we love we love the, the plucky can do Kiwi story, don't we? Until it fucking matters. And yeah. then national just they they tuck their little bollocks up inside their body and go, <laughs> Oh, we 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 surely we can't say anything lest the bigger countries think poorly of us. You know, we must wait for our, our colonial overlords to tell us our position. For fuck's sake. Even Elva didn't like that that analogy, no, that visual no. imagery you gave. No, Jerry Brownlee, he's he is the currently, according to me, the, the holder of the collective national party testicles. They're inside his body now. Goose Fraba. Good, Goose Fraba. Good, good image. Goose Fraba. I got to just get that. Out. I don't know. There was just something when I was watching that again for the third time today that I just went. We're, you, New Zealand is better than that. And what you're doing, Mister Brownlee, is portraying us as a bunch of idiots who can't think for ourselves when you just won't answer the question and painting this country. I thought I thought the right was supposed to be the people who are all, all the patriotic people and who are all like, "Yo, New Zealand can do anything." I don't know. Oh no, no, no. Of course not. Some Ian Brown just got long pants, so we still have to keep talking about everything else today. I don't know what's going on. It's just fuck off. Like, the, the 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 prestige is on the table if you want to look at it this way, right? What's stopping us saying we need a, as close to a neutral third party to stop this wholesale murder of civilians? And we don't have a dog in this fight. We're a country in the South Pacific, miles away from anywhere. You know, we, we'll we'll do the negotiation. And we have the master negotiator on board now, and someone who's very good at mergers. Oh, oh my god, that. we parachute Winston Peters in <laughs> to, to negotiate the ceasefire, knowing that the ceasefire will go indefinitely because the negotiations will go on forever. They'll yeah, never and everyone, be able to, it, it will never be over. They'll all fall asleep because they'll be talking, 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 talking. Constant flow of negotiations and combat operations can't continue until they fail or are successful, which they never will be. Therefore, New Zealand is responsible for lasting peace in the Middle East. And because it's Winston Peters, and we know that Winston Peters never die, it will be (laughs) endless and eternal. We solved it, New Zealand. Take a lap. All right. Uh, super chat from JC. Oh. Another one, JC. Jeez, thank you for your super chat. It's very generous. Our national are either undereducated on the matter or curtailing to Five Eyes narrative. That's the other thing mm. that, that I've heard. We're part of Five Eyes. We're not a little nothing in the bottom of the South Pacific. That's actually, we're a part of this very big, important, secret, some people think very negative group, but we're a part of them. We're in there. 
it's not like we're outside the circle looking in. We're inside. We might be a little. We might be, it might be a small segment of the circle, but we're inside the circle. Uh, Britain just started read, this. Uh, their mail that they can't. The other in 1917, can't. giving Israel carte blanche only per, uh, per, perpetrates the cycle of violence. Hashtag Balfour Declaration. Um, and Excellent. another little super chat there from Peter. Heck of a job, brownies. 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 Sarcastic. Brownies. All right, guys. Uh, let's get into the last story of the day. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy this one because um, I think that the Queen is about to come on your screen, Chewy. So do you need to have an appropriate hat on or something? Or do we stand and... Uh, no, I hat? haven't got a tiara. Maybe I should. Yeah. But I like this. We should um, definitely do bit. that. You should put your swag hat on and I should get a tiara for any time the Queen comes on screen. Um, um, but that face you go. that Seymour's got on there, yeah. that is the appropriate face for someone that is about to be sprayed down from head to toe. Yeah, well, this is great because I've just been criticizing some in the media about and look, I'm not I'm not criticizing Jenny May because you don't always I mean, sometimes we go away from interviews going, Oh, I should have asked that. So it's not that, but it's just that no one ever asks the the sorts of questions and no one ever um asked the question directly to David Seymour of do you call for a ceasefire? And guess who does? The other guest. So let's have a look at David Seymour. We say versus, I don't care, Chloe Swarbrick talking about Gaza and what should be happening. Um, let's talk about Gaza. What did you make, Chloe, of, of Labour coming out, the Labour leader coming out and saying, even though he's caretaker prime minister calling for a ceasefire, which is out of step with what National mm -hmm. has been saying and the caretaker government itself has been saying? Uh, it's about time. I mean, look, and it's the about course damn of the time. time we'll be sitting on this couch for this panel approximately 10 minutes or so. Two Palestinians will die. One of them will be a child. We have a civilian population, which is approximately half the population of Aotearoa New Zealand crammed into a geographical area, which is a third the size of Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, and they are being systematically carpet bombed. Uh, you have, you know, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, organs of the United Nations who are calling this ethnic cleansing, a genocide and just abhorrent beyond all measure of humanity. It is incumbent on all political leaders in this country to stand up to the plate and to say that they call for a ceasefire, a return of hostages. And actually, I would say for the incoming government to recognise the statehood of Palestinians. OK, you mentioned the hostages. <laughs> Is that what one of these? The the microphone? One of, but look, what God, she said. Though, yeah, right? but what she said was very good. These are what the experts are saying. This is a resolution to state. Um, and also hostages have to be released. There's there's nothing there that is not balanced. Stop killing civilians, release the hostages, find a solution. That's what she just said. Mm -hmm. Who could complain about that? Well, some people could complain about that, obviously. Mm -hmm. You would, of course, call on Hamas to release the hostages. Of course, absolutely, she just said that. without doubt. Understand she just said that. She just said that, Ryan. So this is what Do we talked about last Ryan week. Why, why, why are people no. who, are, who aren't in the pocket of Israel, why do they always get asked to denounce Hamas, yet people who are in the pocket of Israel never get asked to denounce the war crimes that they're committing? She just said, and return of the fucking hostages. Ryan's first question, oh, but you would make want the hostages returned, wouldn't you? She just said that, and you're still getting her to defend it. You're still getting her to denounce the actions of Hamas. I hope you're going to ask David Seymour to denounce the bombing of apartment buildings, killing 15,000 civilians, uh, about six or 7,000 of them right now being children and women. I hope you are, Ryan. Because if you don't, you're just a fucking hack that needs to get another job. Why Israel is hesitant to do that without the hostages being released? Yeah, I got to say, look, again, this is all being negotiated by um, the Qatari government yeah. at present. But the other point I would make, Ryan, is that based on reports out of um, actually some of the Jewish families themselves who have been involved in this atrocity, who, who have had family members abducted, uh, they have been actually really upset by the actions of the Israeli government and some of the reports. Of course they have. Israel is bombing places where their people may be being held. Israel could be killing the hostages or a section of them. If you are, and I'm not, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, it's always the accusation, but if you are using human beings as shields, then if you're using the hostages as shields in Israel, you're killing the hostages right now. Doesn't mean that we're saying Hamas should be holding them, but if you're bombing the places where the hostages are, then you're killing the hostages as well as civilians.
reported uh, actions yes. from Benjamin Netanyahu, who apparently has not been prioritising the release of those hostages. Yeah, but they have, some families have some concerns around that, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, I mean, it's, it's all suppose, very well for us to sit on this couch over here I and suppose, try and understand that the intricacies of both sides of this. I do, I do have to say, though, Ryan, I mean, look, you only need to look at the response of politicians in this country on the issue of Ukraine, for example. You only need to look at the position, for example, of the ACT Party in calling for the expulsion of the Iranian ambassador and yeah. calling for the expulsion of the Ukrainian you see, ambassador. It's a point that's been made many times online. What? How do you differentiate these two conflicts and why is your stance? Just quietly, it's a point that's been made many times online. Ryan Bridge is actually saying we would never ask this question, but like I've seen it asked on Twitter, but we would never ask this question. It's a point that we've seen many times online about the different standards of ACT when it comes to Ukraine and Gaza. It's a point that we've seen a lot online. Why haven't we seen it on The Breakfast Show? Why haven't we seen it on The AM Show? So, you know, are you maybe showing a bit behind the curtain there, Ryan, maybe? Somewhat different on both. Uh, well, it's not different at all. Um, we, in all three cases, while the circumstances are quite different, uh, have been clear uh, that humanitarian needs come first, and then we get into the detail of what has actually happened. Now, without traversing Russia, Ukraine and, and Iran, which we could do, because that would be inconvenient to my argument now. So can we please leave that for now? Please, let's not get into that argument. But we, we took positions on those, uh, given the circumstances at the time. Uh, in this circumstance, <sighs> let's just remember how it all started, because that's been forgotten. Hamas, which is a terrorist organisation, was the aggressor, went into that's Israel, they raped, murdered David. and took hostage Children hundreds of all. people. They have still got those hostages. Yeah. Iraq, Iraq, sorry, Israel uh, is defending itself. Yes, but How it's... many more rockets were they supposed to allow to go over the border uh, before they started defending yeah. themselves? I guess the problem I is you've got to look at what's in front of you here and now, don't you? Mm. And, and I, and you know, I agree. It yep. was Hamas that started this particular yep. and, conflict, and it's Hamas but... that continues it because it is Hamas that holds the hostages. It but that Hamas, doesn't give is... Israel carte blanche to just respond in and any yeah. way it wants, well, does well, it? And 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 that's not what they're doing either. You know, there's an incredible double standard here. If any other the country truck but truer words couldn't be spoken david seymour there's an incredible double standard here by people like you giving a different response to the ukrainian situation than the israel gaza situation yes you are correct you're just you're just missing that the point that you're making that about sure you seem like you're about to explode Do you want to say something before we get to uh chloe nailing this man's feet to the ground David Seymour always frames his arguments. He chooses the battlefield. He'll set the parameters of what he's going to discuss. You know, Hamas started this. No, there's not a single thought leader that can look at the Middle East and go, ah, yes, this is a clear starting point for what I'm yeah. talking about. Things that yeah. happen now had their, their conditions set many years ago. And that is probably one of the biggest things about unraveling the Middle East specifically in any issue around Israel is that you go, well, these guys did this, but they did this because you did this. And then you did that because these guys did this. And that all started because this guy drew a line on a map a hundred years ago. And you can't, can you think of, Seymour having a conversation about these things. He's just drawn a field of combat that he wants to discuss. It does not work. It doesn't work. And he's he's drawn his position. This guy should never, ever be anywhere near foreign policy ever. Like <laughs> and, it, and... it offends me on how stupid this is. And you can track in real time how much of an ass kicking he's about to get. It's almost like a graph. You look at Chloe Schwarberg's eyebrows and see how close they get together. The closer they get, the angrier she's going to get. And she is going to wipe the floor with this man who has a depth of thought equivalent to a children's paddling pool. Ah, oh, fucking annoys me. Um, and what you are actually saying, Chewy, is, is one of the places Chloe goes about the start of this. And the difficult thing about this conversation is that the, the the atrocities, the international laws that were broken, the war crimes that were committed by Hamas 
are entering places like the music festival are an a, a, an initiation of what's happening today but they're not the start of the conflict and that's what you've said Chewy, and it's what chloe's going to get to in a minute as well so let's let the, the queen speak it was attacked the way that israel has been attacked I think the world would be saying, yes, this is terrible, but actually the right thing to do is for the other guys to release the hostages and stop attacking Israel. In this case, somehow Israel is at fault and, and the cause are for the Israeli ambassador uh, to be expelled. I'm sorry, but that is completely wrong. No, I am no. absolutely sorry because I cannot let that stand. I mean, you have the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, you have agencies and organs of the United Nations, you have Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, uh, uh, international lawyers across the globe that are saying that this did not start with October 7th. Absolutely, we abhor the abhorrent, abhorrent uh, actions undertaken on October 7th. Yeah. But this started it's, it's a longer 75 yeah. years yeah. ago when 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homeland. They now are pushed into areas where there are border walls around them and they are not able to engage in the same level of uh, just even being day-to-day -day citizens. Totally. They live under laws which are effectively apartheid. I think what David's referring to is this particular phase of the conflict. As you said, yeah. it has been and, running for many yeah. decades. And, look, and they, they too are victims. I mean, I feel for the Palestinian people, but they too are victims. I feel for the Palestinian people, but just not enough to get Israel to stop bombing them and flattening the their apartment buildings. Pile but I feel of for dead them. kids is not yet high enough. Yeah, not quite. Not quite. Victims of decision. Hamas. This is a terrorist organization. This is an organization that mixes up humanitarian and civilian activities with terrorist activities. Now, the right answer is for Hamas to release the terrorists mm. first and foremost and stop terrorizing their own people and stop terrorizing people in Israel. If that happens, then we are okay. You, you, and 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 what, do you want mm. Hamas, mm. the military wing of Hamas, living living to be destroyed? It. Terrorism should not exist. Right. Or so, so you, no, but you, let me, want, let me you want them gone? Let me just be really, really the... crystal clear here because I don't think that this question has been put to David anywhere near forthrightly enough by media. David, do yeah. you call for a ceasefire? I call for Clearly. The, I call for the hostages to do be released. Do you call for a ceasefire, David? If the hostages are released, then maybe you can have a ceasefire. Are you willing to call for recognition of Palestinian statehood? No, I'm, I'm responsible. I'm calling for a two-state solution. Which requires that acknowledging is, yeah. and accepting mm. that Palestine exists. What an yes, idiot. and that means that, of course, it means Palestine exists. So will you support uh, a motion to acknowledge Palestinian statehood in our parliament? Uh, not while Hamas are running it, because at the moment... Yeah. Uh, this you is the problem you get. I mean, so, I understand... This is the I understand. feedback loop. Hamas was originally yeah. supported by the Israeli government in order to keep in, uh, under suppression the Palestinian people. Mm. Again, we need some historical context, yeah. and I think that it's incumbent on our political leaders to stand up to the plate to call for that ceasefire, mm. because, David, what you're currently practising is what about is it? Well, 12,000 yeah. innocent yeah. Chloe, civilians... Chloe, Chloe, I, Chloe I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you're on the moral high ground on this issue, to be quite honest. I, I do Fuck think, Chloe, you know, you, you can raise your voice and shout. I don't think anyone sitting on this I couch... I was shouting. I, it's very patchy. So, sorry, I, sorry, I didn't mean to say you were shouting, but I don't think anyone on this couch wants to see what's going on in Gaza right now happening. Of course not. Anyone wants to perpetuate that. But two of us on this couch, Ryan, hold positions of privilege and power in our parliament. One of us is a major leader of an incoming government. We have the opportunity to join with other international leaders and use every ounce of political power that we have to facilitate that call for ceasefire and, and ultimately and call, to facilitate that two-state solution, and your which call requires for yeah. recognising and Palestine. And your call for ceasefire is regardless of whether any hostages are handed back or not. Yeah. If we have that ceasefire and the ends to the abhorrence which is currently being rained down on, but, on but civilians... Do you, but do you call for a ceasefire even if the hostages are not returned? Both have to happen simultaneously, Ryan. Right, right so right then now, you both so, have the same so, position. So, yes, no, no, we both have the same position. No, we do not, because a ceasefire... Mm -hmm results in the end of unnecessary suffering I, I and death. I think this is a very complex issue, and that, frankly, there's, there's been far too much politics played over it. We need to first of all recognise the humanity, then recognise the complexity, and then speak calmly for a solution. All right. Which is a ceasefire. We have to leave this here, I'm afraid, because we... <sighs> Apparently... Oh, how can you... How can we politicise a war? Yeah. War is politics with the gloves off. 
what we have to speak we have idiot. to speak calmly i don't know i don't think there's too much we can add to that chloe swarbrick um for prime minister for president for whatever she wants it's like you know it's it's just it's it's i i'm i'm going to be angry tonight um but you know what happens is tv3 needs to get to their ad break before the news so we'll just wrap this up here and leave a whole bunch of questions hanging and you know, like Ryan said, no one here wants to see this. Yeah, but only one of the three of you is calling for a, a way for it to actually stop. Certainly, uh, Seymour actually said, you know, I'm not calling for a ceasefire until the hostages are released. Well, so there's not going to be a ceasefire. Because so equally, you could, you equally you could say yeah. Hamas aren't going to release the ceasefires until uh, release the hostages until there's a ceasefire. And then it goes around and around and around. And this is the important part to hear. More civilians die. That's, that's at, at the end of a Jewish missile, or an Israeli missile, I should say. At the end of an Israeli missile. You attacked us and you stole a whole bunch of our citizens and we want them back. And that's why we're bombing you. Okay, we want the bombings to stop and we want some of our grievances to be aired. Yes, we have all your hostages. Will you stop bombing us? Not until you give us our hostages back. Okay. How about we give you some of the hostages and you stop the bombings for a little bit and we can talk about this? Like, that's like literally, that's the negotiation. Like, and you have intellectual giants, just colossal mm. intellects that we can muster. The walking haircut, Ryan Bridge, and David Seymour, who sounds like he's about to slip into a valiant coma. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, it's just, like, if I speak slower, I'm going to sound like I am smarter than I am on an area that I very clearly, and I want to reiterate this to you, Ryan, that I have absolutely no knowledge or expertise on it at all. I just named one of the countries Iraq. That's not one of the countries that's involved at all. How foolish of me. Still. Yeah. I'm the smart one, and my colleague here is a woman, so should be disregarded because she's a gentle soul, a lovely little girl who should be knitting and looking at kittens. That is what's implied there, and she just destroyed both of them and should, by rights of combat, take both of their jobs. Yeah, although I, I have to be careful telling people that they messed up their words because I just called it a Jewish missile, which is completely wrong an Israeli missile um I miss my words all the time but I'll tell you one other thing before we wrap up and it's I was looking for it in the chat someone sort of said something similar to this there was one powerful person on that stage of the three and she annihilated the other two men who appeared to me from time to time through that were patronizing her like she shouldn't have been the powerful one oh, there like always yeah all right I think I'm done you got anything else you want a tangent to Chewy? I want to leave with one thing because it popped up on my YouTube recommends the other day, and I think it it's um, sorry, I'm just trying to cue it up and it's fighting me. Um, I think it has a lot of currency with yeah. what we're talking about here. Yeah. Have you seen Have you seen this, Pat? No, I have not. All right. Star Trek predicts everything. A um, little conversation about terrorism norm would be defined by my program as unnecessary and unacceptable mm -hmm. by my program as well data but if that is so captain why are their methods so often successful i've been reviewing the history of armed rebellion and it appears that terrorism is an effective way to promote political change yes it can be but i have never subscribed to the theory that political power flows from the battle of a gun yet there are numerous examples when it was successful the independence of the mexican state from spain the irish unification of 2024 and the kenzie rebellion yes i'm aware of them then would it be accurate to say that terrorism is acceptable when all options for peaceful settlement have been foreclosed ah. okay so these are questions that mankind has been struggling with throughout history your confusion is only human hmm. Much of the I thought that was uh, bang on. Because, um, yeah, pick up a history book. Like, you could chuck in Vietnam. You could chuck in a, a bunch of states that came out of revolution. 
you can look at a bunch of armed struggles that turned into a negotiation that turned into a political sharing of power. And at the yeah. moment, it just sucks because there's a whole bunch of civilians and kids in, in the middle. And and that is the consistent message that is coming out is we want the civilians to get the fuck out of the way and they can't. Mm. Because as Chloe said, it's a third of the size of Auckland. And you have nowhere to go. And and the areas that you're being told to get to, you might get bombed on the way. You might not have the ability to move. You know, you're on foot, certainly. It's 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 unacceptable. It is a, in its current form of genocide. There is there is nothing, in my opinion, that justifies the, the actions that Israel are taking. They have much better options. The people who I, I've heard people over the weekend, commentators in that talking about how it's not a genocide because there are lots of, you know, Palestinians left and that won't be wiping out of the whole group. To which if I was involved in those commentaries, I would say, so therefore you don't think the Holocaust was a Jewish genocide. Lots of Jews still left. So you don't think that was a mm-hmm. genocide. So you can't use that because there's some left over. It's the ambition <laughs> of it's the ambition of trying to wipe out a, a race or a group of people and, you know, Sorry about flattening build. And I know people are going to say the other argument is, you know, Israel could finish it tomorrow by literally flattening, flattening the whole of Gaza. Yeah, they could. But, I mean, equally, I guess, Hitler could have killed all of the Jews on the same day as well. But they systematically did it over a long period of time. It's just, I, I, I'm i ignorant and, and, and I'm... I'm the dumbest in the room. I'm happy to be that. But I will, I will err to those who know better than me. And those without the political bias or the affiliation with either side, the the groups that are like the Amnesty Internationals or the UNs or the whatever, I'm happy to follow them and their lead as to what this is versus the IDF or versus Hamas or versus the this group here who was aligned with Israel or versus this group here who was aligned with Hamas. And all of those groups the ones that are independent, I um, they're caught, they're using words like that, genocide, genocide. They're using words like an open air prison, you know. They're using words like war crimes, you know, uh, humanitarian crimes. So, I'm prepared to throw my uh, my 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 hat in with those guys and go. Uh, uh, they're not my words. Like someone said to me today, you you're not educated enough, and neither am I to, to class whether these are war crimes. It was on my Twitter feed, and I went. I don't need to be educated enough to do it. I can read Article 33 and what it says of the Geneva Convention. Mm. And it says very clearly, collective punishment, punishing a group of people who aren't directly responsible for the crimes is a crime. So I don't I don't need to be educated. Or, or I think I said that the only level of education I need is to be able to read this article. Here it is. It's undisputable. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, it's undisputable because there's not a part that says, but you can do a war crime if they do this. You know, it, it's like when they attack that ambulance, which was another very clear violation of um, international law, it was a very clear war crime, a violation of the Geneva Convention as well, I believe. You cannot target ambulances. And it doesn't matter if it was packed to the gunnels with Hamas fighters and ammunition and that you cannot hit it. You can hit the people that get out of it if they're identified as combatants. If they were unloading explosives for it, you can hit them then. You cannot hit the ambulance. Yeah. And we, we those rules were set, you know, post-World War One or around that time. And Israel has much higher capabilities of identifying what an ambulance looks like, who got into the ambulance, and what came out of it. They they chose to hit an ambulance. <laughs> it's a war crime. And genocides like the Holocaust didn't immediately start with the gas chambers in the concentration camps. They wound up to this. And it's the same situation we're looking at, at how Gaza is treated by being surrounded on, on two sides by Israel by having all of their border crossings controlled in some way by other countries. Um, you know, I, actually on three sides, because on, on the ocean side, that's pro- patrolled by the IDF Navy. 
Mm-hmm. So, so what the fuck are you going to do? But I've seen Gaza referred to as an open air prison because of the walls and because of the surveillance and because of the absolute control uh, other countries have of um, food supplies, um, economic means coming into the Gaza area. Um, let me wrap up with this, right? Because I just said what it was and I'll show it to you. I find the argument of people saying, well, we're not educated enough to do this. The same as flat earth is going, well, I've never been to the moon. How do I know that it's really in outer space? I've never been there. Have you ever been there? Article 33, individual responsibility, collective penalties, uh, pillage, reprisals. No protected person, and in war a protected person is a civilian, may be punished for an offence he or she has not personally committed collective penalties and likewise all measures of intimidation uh, or of terrorism are prohibited. I don't need to be educated in what a war crime is. I can fucking read. Not now, a lot of what, wiggle room in there, Pat. <laughs> what that means is Hamas committed a war crime going into the music festival. And what it means is Israel continues to commit war crimes. There is no wriggle room in this. It's in black and white. And for this show, it's fucking highlighted in blue. Hmm. That's really clear that they executed people based on that that provision post-World yeah. War II because it was a tactic of the literal Nazis that if there were partisans in the area, they did this on the Western Front, they did this in France. Um, if, if there were partisan activities and... Uh, German soldiers were attacked, then they would go to the village where they thought the partisans lived and they would do some nasty shit. They'd burn the whole village down. They'd shoot every male in, in the in the place. It's, it's the same, it's the same level. And they've they've gone, Hamas have done this. We can't tell who Hamas is. So everybody that lives in Gaza is Hamas now. Yep. Collective punishment. There's there's, there's no there's no wiggle room. There's no negotiation. It's it's really clear what it is. Ironically. And the thing that infuriates me is that we're not going to have a clear end to this where there is, you know, that you can sweep in and go, all right, so we're from The Hague. We're here to find the guys from Israel that are responsible for war crimes. And we're here to find the guys from Hamas that are responsible for war crimes or terrorist activities. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be that clear sense of justice. There's just going to be bodies. I think we need to shoot off because if we don't, I'm going to be awake until 4 a.m. over this. Hey, thanks for being with us, team. I have appreciated it. It's not a big big group of people watching. Oh, something else I was going to tell you. Um, We actually have a really good engagement. I'll see if I can find that because I I took a photo of it. We have a really good engagement of people who um, watch, who are subscribed to us, who watch our content versus people who don't i mean a lot of places it's like 92 percent of people who watch this video are mm. unsubscribed we actually have a really it's actually quite a good interaction last 28 oh, days two thirds really of good. the people watching our videos are subscribed now the good thing about that means is you guys are watching stuff that you like the bad thing about that means maybe we're not showing up in algorithms as much as we could for the not subscribe mm. to see us so first question or first thing i'd ask of you if you're not subscribed this is from youtube if you're not subscribed to us youtube primarily then a subscription if you think we've earned it would be greatly appreciated Uh, And when we do make clips and stuff, if you share them around, maybe some more of those not subscribed people out there who watch our stuff occasionally, we'll see what we do. We'll join us on board, subscribe with us. We're about to take over 4,000 subscribers, I think. And when we started this, uh, when I started this way, way back, it was next to nothing. Um, And so 4,000 sounds like quite a nice number to get to by uh, by Christmas time. Um, There may be more who will subscribe or who will see us will subscribe as well. So, yep, that's but, but just so you know, in this world, that's a pretty good viewership rate for subscribe versus not subscribe. But as I said, the downside of it means maybe we're not showing up in people's algorithms who aren't subscribed to us to find us. Maybe we can do something about that together. All right, team. Thanks so much for being with us. I oh, uh, appreciate you. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to do this, Pat. I'm, oh, I've I'm got no sorry. time for a tangent. Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> that's Thanks, a very JK. Good- that's Amazing. a very good Photoshop.
that is a very very good photoshop <laughs> there we go we, we well can done. we can go there yeah. That's you know what? Let's can we have that? You know how we talk about a, a, a bucket full of baby sloths? Well, this will be our bucket full of baby sloths instead. We want a bit of a cheer up at the end of the thing. We'll we'll have um Simeon's lollipop with dad in the front seat, <laughs> taking him to get his big pants, big boy pants. <laughs> All right, guys, love you to bits. Thanks for being with us tonight. A bit ranty tonight. Apologize if that's not your thing. Um, but be back with us again tomorrow night at 9 p.m. for another edition where I'm sure we'll be much happier. And much more lighthearted. Probably not, but look forward to uh <laughs> look forward to seeing you tomorrow night from 9 p.m. for another edition of Big Hearing News. Hooray team. Cheers, fam. <laughs>